All right, Pete Giuliano, it is Friday, the 27th of August, 2021, and that makes this... Solder Spoke 232-232. Crank it in, Ralph. Crank it in. And you too, Robert. Crank it in, Robert. Yes, Robert, son of Moses, um, who, who wrote in to us, and uh, he said that his... His son really gets into listening to this whole thing, and that is really, really fantastic. So crank it in, Ralph, and crank it in, Robert. Pete, a lot of good stuff happened. And first, got to ask you, when is the GQRP Club Convention? September 4th and 5th. September 4th and 5th. I love GQRP Club, but hint, guys, you got to put the date up there on the website because I checked the dev website to see where the convention was, and all I could see was soon. Anyway, good. Excellent. And I know you're going to be one of the esteemed speakers. Yeah, me again. <laughs> <laughs> smart guys, those GQRPs. Well, 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 I don't know if they're so smart. <laughs> Having me talk about tubes and CW. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta tell you, it's, you know the, that's the, a little, the Brits, it's a little the scary. Brits, the Brits are known for their very wry sense of humor. There you go. <laughs> this may be a form of Britannic revenge. Yes. They said, yes, let's get uh, the, the Mr. Giuliano to speak. Yes. What should we have him talk about? Oh, I don't know. CW and tubes? All, all in the same breath. <laughs> I think it's going to be great. We're going to be looking forward to see that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, other bits of news that I wanted to mention here at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if guys saw this, but there is the possibility of us getting back the five meter band. Ooh. EI7GL, who has a, a really excellent blog, mostly covering VHF stuff in Europe. But he reported the other day that there are moves afoot to return the five meter band to the use of radio amateurs now that regular analog tv is going the way of the dinosaurs and so this is freeing up the space around tv channel two which is what caused the five meter band to be lost way back in the in the 40s in the first place so this could be a possible victory for Frank Jones and the Five Meter Liberation Army. Stay tuned. This is really interesting. We'll talk about this some well, more. Well, four meters would be better. Because, well, because there's a lot of gear out there. I mean, that, the Brits used the four meter band all the time. They used the four meter band, but also the four meter band and the five meter band. And, of course, the six meter band, the whole area. Yeah. That'd be, that could be pretty good. Yeah. So I would like to see, if for no other reason than to vindicate Frank Jones and Michael Hopkins... I'd like to see five meters come back. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Stickers. You know, we've been talking about stickers. I got these wonderful IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electronic Worker, Electronic Wizard stickers. And a number of guys did send in self-addressed stamped envelopes, as you suggested. And I distributed a bunch of these stickers. Right now, these stickers are being used at NASA, the Goddard mm -hmm. Space Flight Center, at Johns Hopkins lab for advanced advanced physics lab J. Johns hopkins apl and a number of other locations it's not too late guys if you want some of these stickers send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll get it to you finally weather report pete we're not talking about like rain and precipitation we're talking about solar weather here this is the weather that's that, that counts to us cycle 25 looking better looking better today I just checked before we came on the fiber optic cable. The solar flux index this morning is 93. Wow. The sunspot number is 47. Wow. And K indexes are down at reasonable levels. Let the good times roll. I'm starting to notice that 17 meters is perking up. I'm working some DX on 17. So, I don't know. It's time to start thinking about directional antennas. We'll talk about that in a bit. But Pete, what is on your bench? Well, hey, I just wanted to comment. I, I worked my first ever, first ever 3D2. I saw that on your in, screen. In and, Fiji. and you did it with that, that unusual mode. Yes, FT8. I FT8. mean, there was absolutely nothing else showing on 17 meters except this cluster of signals at 18.1. <clears throat> I, I, I mean, if you tuned across the phone band, you'd say it's dead. No, it's not open. Yeah. 
but 3D2. I find that I find that often. And congratulations on the 3D2 contact. That is pretty cool. But I, I, as I'm working on different rigs, I too have been firing up kind of web SDRs, looking at 17 meters. There's a guy. Uh, I think he's up in Pennsylvania. Kilo Echo Five Station has his web SDR on the uh, air. Uh, NA5B in DC doesn't have 17 meters, so I, I can't. Well, he does. He has it on a Kiwi, but it's not on the uh, on the regular web SDR. So I look at the station up in Pennsylvania, and I agree with you. Sometimes you'll look at the band, and it, there'll be not a CW signal nor a phone signal anywhere in the band, and you'll think the band is dead. But then you look around 18.1. And there's all these FT8 signals there. So there's an indication that well, that also may be a sign that it's time to call CQ in the phone band. See if somebody will come back to you. Yeah. But um, but congratulations. But what do you, now, wait a second. You've gone tubular with us now, Pete, in preparation for the GQRP. Tell us about this. Well, e yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting. Um, actually, I was approached by Steve Hartley. And he said uh, they took a survey uh, of the... Uh, GQRP club members and said what topics would you like to see and uh, interestingly enough uh, let's not talk about two for a second about some of the other speakers um, Charlie Morris Charlie Morris is going to be one of the featured speakers and he has a huge following on YouTube and uh, Roy Llewellyn uh, the easy neck guy and then Tony Fishpole has got a uh, kind of a brilliant presentation. I saw parts of it dealing with measure, test and measurement. I mean, this is real cloud. <laughs> I mean, this is this is names that you, you well recognize and subjects that are of a lot of interest. And then Steve said, a few guys wanted to hear about tubes. <laughs> Would you be interested in making a presentation on tubes? So, um it's kind of interesting because I thought at first, oh, I'll just throw up a tube transmitter and we'll go over that. But then um, my presentation is more on, you ask the time, I'm going to tell you how to build a watch. And one of the most curious things is uh, going back in time and looking at all the tube transmitters that were published. And of course, uh, a source of those, uh, a huge source of those was in, in QST. I got to be honest with you, Bill, I would not build one of those QST rigs today. I mean, it's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, you look you look in the handbook in 57 and 61, there's power supplies with no fuses in them. I mean, who builds a, a high voltage power supply without a fuse? The, the fuse is the tube. I mean, when you smoke the tube, yeah, okay, we smoke the tube, but that that's nuts. There, there's other public circuits. This guy's got a 68 microfarad, 450 volt electrolytic capacitor with no bleeder on it. So you you think about about an hour or two after you shut the power supply <laughs> off, and you put your hand in there, you're gonna it'll be, remind you. Yeah, it'll remind you. I mean, these were published articles, and and the other thing that was kind of scary is one of the most frequently used uh, transmitter forms was called the TriTet. It was invented in 1933 by James Lamb, W1CEI, who was the uh, QST technical editor. And th that tritet ruled the roost. And one of the things that's um, significant about the tritet, it's got a it's got a link coupled output. And he goes on to say, uh, this is a very stable oscillator rich in harmonics. Where do you think those harmonics are going? <laughs> I mean, link, link coupled into an Ed Fan antenna. What do you think is going to be happening? So, I mean, I tried to highlight uh, in my presentation about all these factors that you need to look at. And if you're going to be serious about building uh, a, a tube type transmitter today, and then we can take that one step forward, um, not limiting the tubes. There are three interesting things. First of the the designs may not meet today's standards. As a matter of fact, you saw that in the Tuna Tin 2, which was built in 1970. The uh, ARRL reissued that in uh, uh, in the 90s or 2000 time frame. And they said, by the way, you got to put a different low pass filter on this because it doesn't meet the spectral purity standards. So they reissued the Tuna Tin 2. So, I mean, this this is kind of an issue that I think is important. The other thing is, too, is 
panel meters. Panel meters are in the plate circuit. So, I mean, you have everything underneath the chassis <laughs> and, and it's all protected except for that panel meter right behind the front panel. It's got 450 volts on it. <laughs> you know, these are things that are this, this, scary. This was back, back when hams were hams and lived dangerously. <laughs> or... or they or keep, didn't. They keep the high voltage. <laughs> you know, instead of cathode. So anyway, I'm just giving you a little preview here, what I want to cover. And then there actually is a, a project. There's a right, well, it's one, gonna, one It's going to be with, with one tube. One tube. I don't want to, I don't want to be a spoiler, no spoiler alert here, but we'll let you, we'll let the, uh, the listeners tune in because GQRP club members from around the world, can uh, can click on the uh, the link and, and watch uh, Pete Giuliano live make his presentation there. I think it's going to be well, well worth it. Now speaking of tubes, you you have also been looking at another tube rig, but we're shifting away a little bit from 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 CW back into your your comfort zone, Pete. Your your preferred mode uh, of SSB, and I'm talking about the SR160. Yes. You well, tell us about this. Okay. Well, this is this is kind of fascinating. You, well, the little judicious shopping, you can find some very nice radios for a hundred bucks. And the SR-160 was one of the first offerings in a transceiver from Helicopters about 1961. That was a tri-bander, 80, 40, and 20. And, and I find it kind of fascinating that in 1961, they would limit it to 80, 40, and 20 because you were in cycle 19 at that time. But I'm, I think the problem was technology, was to build something in, in the way that that was built would be difficult. It, it used the 9 and 5, the 9 and 5, so it's a right. 9 megahertz VFO, 5 mm -hmm. megahertz crystal filter. And mm -hmm. they did something really interesting with that. Uh, on 80 and, and 70, it's just 75, it's just like your Mythbuster. You know, it's right. the sum of the difference. Except on 40, instead of shifting like the Swans did, shift the VFO frequency. They kept the same VFO range, and they actually heterodyne a 3.4 kilohertz oscillator with that. So they shifted the, the VFO output. The VFO wasn't changed, but the VFO output was in a mixer stage, shifted to 12 megahertz. Ah, so 12 yeah. minus 5 is 7. So you right. have side I mean, the, the, Yeah, like you said, the Swan, they didn't, they didn't mix with the, the, the Swan... 240 they didn't mix it they just switched it. in yeah. some different lc elements to get it to yeah. 12 megahertz yeah yeah, yeah. So, oh that's that's really that's so, really cool i think i may be wrong about this but i think mike w2d had to select like like the best hf transceivers i think that he had the sr160 in there i may be wrong from the early 60s yeah so, yeah so it really was it was and it had rit <laughs> the luxury <laughs> the luxury yeah luxury all right so i got this for 100 bucks and it was missing two things i mean cosmetically it was in pretty good shape the main tuning dial had a spun aluminum inlay which was missing and i hardly recommend you contact mark olson ke9 pq because he sells a lot of stuff for these old vintage rigs and the spun inlays uh, the same one that I put in there to replace it was uh, also used on the SB200. So if you have an SB200 knob or SB220 that's missing the inlay, you can you can get them. And he even tells you how to install them. I mean, this is really cool. The guy said, don't use super glue. <laughs> you know, if you're going to install this thing, you use contact cement. So the other problem was right on most of the helicrafter, all the helicrafter rigs have a logo on them now your s38 has a a sort of a black logo but yeah the I'm looking at right now the transceivers and you can actually buy replacement logos for the black ones the transceivers mm -hmm. the sr160 sr400 they have a red logo mine was missing a red logo so i said okay how are you going to fix this so i took a i i found some manuals that had the red logo on it i i reduced them in size uh, you, you know, just took a, a screen print of it and then reduced it in size and then made a couple different sizes and printed it on photo paper. 
So it came out and I cut it out of the photo paper and I, I made a, I fabricated a plastic disc and, and then I uh, contact cemented the plastic disc and then on the backside I put a piece of Gorilla tape that I on backside s cemented to the uh, disc put that logo in there you look at it you can't tell that it isn't a factory logo commercial opportunity here Pete. <laughs> there you go they put these things out of the web you could make i don't know dozens of dollars it would be great <laughs> no it's just you, you know the thing is you have some technology to fill the gap that it once was standard and i guess guys collect these logos you, they do. You, no, and I'm only only half kidding here because the, the, there's a demand for this kind of stuff because a lot of people are really interested in in kind of the cosmetic restoration of the the exterior of these rigs. Yeah. So that's a pretty cool way of doing it. Yeah. It's, it's very satisfying <clears throat> to kind of combine the old with the new too. Yeah, and and actually uh, the circuitry wise uh, is pretty. It has some weird tubes in there I've never seen before. Like you ever heard of a 12 AW6? No. Nope. Uh, it's the RF amplifier tube. Hmm. I mean, normally you see a, a 6DC6 or a 12BZ6 or something like that. And I mean, there's some pretty standard RF amplifier tubes, but i never heard of a 12AW6. They must have got a deal on them. <laughs> you know, they got a deal and they, okay, what are we going to do? We'll put them in there. Well, somebody found a box of them. The but here, here's, here's the thing that's fascinating. You can find tubes for these very inexpensively. So I said... I, I don't have a 12 aw6 and if that thing shoots craps what do i do you go to ebay i bought three new in box 12 aw6 for nine bucks oh man yeah <laughs> so you're good to go yeah so you're good to go so i mean you know finding some replacement tubes uh is not difficult and you can you can you know actually uh, acquire repair parts and spare parts for a few dollars so I, I, think, I think I think Grace and Evans might have some influence on you here, Pete. I think that might be part of what's going on. <laughs> Grace and the whole the whole uh, thermotron thing is starting to seep through the web. That's good. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's surprising these radios work. You you have to do some things. You have to uh, think out of the box a little bit, like uh, coming up with the logo. But uh, for the most part, the radio works pretty well. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm kind of enjoying operating it because you can get on the air now. You get a little spoiled because um, some of these, you know, the dial the dial is not linear. Okay, <laughs> that's, 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 the dial is not I mean, linear. And this and this bugs you, I know. <laughs> the dial's not linear. I mean, because you get it to you get it the high end or the low end, and it's. You know, you go, you can, uh, you can see everything. You get at the other end, and the tick marks are a blur. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But Galaxy solved that problem. You know that okay. to be, you know that to be the case. So, same vintage rigs. One guy had a linear dial readout, another guy didn't. Why? A lot of it had to do with the circuitry. A yeah. series to a series tuned clap or a series tuned culpits in which they had. The, the variable capacitor in series with the coil, that that did a lot. Also, the type of capacitor, whether you're using a, 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 t a capacitor with kind of a logarithmic variation in capacitance, one of these with weird, kind of weird shaped, you know, yeah. rotor, rotors on it, that helped too. I noticed, Pete, also the, the VFO that you recommended, that you, that you caused me to get, and I'm pointing to it right over here. You could see the, yeah. the Mythbuster behind me. That's got the Yesu nine megahertz of vfo in there it's analog circuitry it's remarkably linear yeah um so it is possible <laughs> you know you wonder i agree with you why not you should have done yeah. it well, it, well it was not like it's a shift in technologies 10 years later and someone figured out how to do it these were all being made at the same time I know. so I you, know. you wonder I know. why okay yeah. a couple other things here uh first of i'd like to i'm happy to report i've had 72 requests for the code for the direct conversion receiver 72 requests and very few of those are from the u.s most of them are offshore so it kind of tells you where home proves taking place and a lot of it is in europe most of it is in europe yep and 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 so I and I, and how many of these guys are actually going ahead and building it too? I mean, that's the other thing. Well, I I suspect that we're probably going to see about half of that, about 30, yeah. 35. So that's that's 
kind of amazing in itself, you know, that you'd see that many people actually building a project. It's interesting when you see the, uh, you see, see me on a lot of the, the comments that, that come in and go out and questions, and the questions are often good ones, and you can see the guys are struggling with, you know, getting this thing to work, thinking about it in a modular form, as you've been encouraging them to do, and, and doing that, you, you could almost see the kind of the light bulbs going on on people's heads, realizing that I, I have to have a certain level of, of, um, a VFO input. I have to do this right. I have to do that right. And uh, a lot less kind of far fewer comments where people just sort of throw up their hands and say, well, I built it, but it doesn't work. Pete must be nuts. Yeah. <laughs> Something like your design, yeah. the favorite, your design sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't but, hear that too much. But do you, you have another victory going and that's with simple SSB. Yes. And yeah. that's a lot of it through our, our friend Dean, KK4DAS, my neighbor here in Fairfax County, Virginia. And, man, th that is really encouraging. He's got a bunch of these things going. And my favorite so far <clears throat> was the KI7NSS yes. Pacific 40. Yes. Wow. Talk about, talk about homebrew eye candy. There you go. Yeah. Well, what's even more fascinating, he, he says this is the first thing he's ever built. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it, it was amazingly beautiful. I put it. I have a. I have the uh, the of the video and some other things that uh, that that he's that he has on there, and on on the blog. Check it out. He's also using it. He's using that rig for uh, summits on the air. He's taking it out onto mountaintops and working people with it. It's almost it's almost too beautiful to take out into the woods. Yeah. Yeah. But but, it, but, but you really notice cool. he, he takes a mast with him, a beam mast, when he goes up there. So he, and he looks this all up there. <laughs> so okay. But this is this is really really wonderful, and I, and I, it's it, it just it it just shows uh, the influence of Giulianismo is reaching out to the world. I, I, it's it's a very positive thing. And it? I should also tell you, it's got a blue case. Well, I mean, that's worth at least two S units. <laughs> yeah, we always yeah. say it. it's always it's worth at least two S units. So, so great stuff, Pete. Really, really terrific. Cool. So, should we talk about the MythBuster? Yes, please. You can see it. I've got it over here behind me. I like it a lot. Now, the evolution of this thing—it's got a kind of a typical solder smoke homebrew evolution. It really all started when Pete sent me an email saying, "Hey, check out this eBay." They're selling this um, this part from an old FT-101, and it looks like it's got a nice capacitor with anti-backlash gearing on it. And at that point, I had bought a couple of these Galaxy 5 VFOs because of the anti-backlash uh, capacitors in there. So I thought, well, I'll just buy this thing. That was like 40 bucks, and I'll get I'll be able to take the capacitor out. But when the box came, I looked at it, and it was the entire analog VFO circuitry out of an FT-101 and hanging from the bottom were three lines, three wires that had been very carefully cut and they were just the three, the one I needed for, for VCC, for power, one was the uh, oscillator output and the third was for a clarifier. You could actually have a little RIT circuit in there and I fired it up and it looked beautiful. The output was beautiful. It needed, you know, six volts regulated and then I started thinking, all right, I got a nine megahertz VFO what am I going to do with this? And then I, we started talking about the uh, the legend, where the USB LSB convention came from. Why is it that we use LSB below 10 megahertz and USB above? And there's a couple of kind of goofy. Um, well, there's, there's one main urban legend that says that well, if you do it this way, if you have a nine megahertz filter, right? and a five megahertz SSB generator, right? Actually, they, if, they, they said if you, if you do it that way with a nine megahertz filter, which, which are pretty common now, and a five megahertz VFO, which was common because that was the ARC-5, the command set VFO. If you put them two together, then magically you'll get to 75 meter LSB and 20 meter USB without having to change the carrier oscillator BFO crystal. Wow ho! So this is used often as the explanation for why we have this convention. It's not true. It'll work. It'll work if you switch the frequencies. If you use a 5.2 megahertz filter 
and a 9 megahertz VFO. Then it'll work. Then you'll end up with low SB, lower sideband on 75, U, upper sideband on 20. And so that's what sort of start, started me building using that, uh, that FT-101 VFO. And that's what, what led to the, to the Mythbuster. Now, there were other, other bits going along the way, too. Uh, one day I was out for my walk, my, my pandemic walk through the neighborhood, and somebody was throwing out a couple of nice pieces of pine board. And I grabbed them and brought them home. One became a shelf that's now supporting an HW7 and an HW8 here in the shack. The other was just the right size for a homebrew rig. So I started the al fresco construction on this piece of shelving material. And that became the, ultimately became the base of the, uh, of the rig. I wanted to go with a 10-pole crystal filter because of conversations with SDR guys on the air. When I would tell them that I was not using SDR, that I was using HDR, and that my filter was made out of little bits of quartz rock, a crystal filter. One guy, I guess he was faking it, or I don't know whether he said, oh my gosh, he says, your skirts must be atrocious. You know, if you look at the waterfalls now, almost all these SDR signals are almost completely rectangular. So I said, I want to try to, to, to replicate that, but not using SDR techniques, using HDR techniques, using crystal filters. And I figured a 10-pole filter would do that. The, the, it would, it would, you'd, the resulting shape of the bandpass would be very similar to what you'd get out of an SDR rig. And I think, it, I think that's, that's worked. It was kind of fun building the, uh, the, S, the, the filter using G3 UUR techniques and stuff from Chuck Adams, uh, various bits of software, trying to experiment a little bit with the capacitor values. I've, I've put up a, a series of videos, about 16 videos, short, each of them about 5-10 minutes long, on the Solder Smoke website. You guys can, can take a look at whatever portion of this project uh, kind of appeals to you. But I, I like it because it, it refutes the urban legend. It makes a lot of use of kind of parts and components that were just in the junk box or found on the curb here in the neighborhood. For example, the cabinet. I built, I'm not good at cabinetry. I'm not, I'm not good at woodworking. But I had some of this kind of thin, kind of almost like, a, I guess, like a quarter inch or five mil um, plywood that was discarded when they, from when they d delivered the, uh, the treadmill machine for, for, that we have upstairs in the, living, in the TV room. I just kept the material, and that became the box that I built for the Mythbuster. And then, Pete, this one little final bit. You'll, you can see on the Mythbuster that it has an internal speaker, and I have... The speaker was just sitting there kind of exposed and I, I, it needed some protection so I don't accidentally jab a pencil in there and break the speaker cone. So I found on my walk last week this little bit of screen material, all right, about six by six. And I just grabbed it, brought it home, spray painted it black, cut it down to four by four, and now that is on the front cover of the Mythbuster. It gives it more, almost more of a steampunk kind of look. I'll put a picture of it up on the blog. But I had, um, I had fun with, uh, with, with the, with the Mythbuster. A couple. I, I just wanted to mention a couple things, and these are, these are rigs that I know that you, you remember from way back when. Um, two rigs. I, when I started looking at into this whole, whole issue of the urban legend, I came across um, Tony Vitale's cheap and easy SSB. W2 EWL. Right in about 1959, 1960, Tony uh, came up with a, a really cool, easy SSB rig built around an ARC 5. He built it around an ARC 5. It was a phasing rig. And you know, you, you read about this and it just it just kind of brings you back to the to the old days of, of ham home brew and, and what things were like in the good old days. The other rig that came up shortly thereafter was really one of the early filter rigs and that was the imp by w4 imp uh Gillespie, joe Gillespie. neither of these guys were professional engineers they were both just hobbyists Gillespie was an optometrist and but they wanted they, they were very enthusiastic about the then new mode of ssb and they started looking for ways to, to kind of home brew stuff they put it in qst hundreds of guys if not thousands of guys would then say okay i'm going to build something like this and you started seeing an explosion that's what really led to kind of the explosion this was before we got we had rigs like this the swan monobanders or the heath monobanders 
So there were commercial SSB rigs out, but there were also a lot of homebrew rigs. I just want to read, Pete, if I could, real quick, a page that I, I found in an Electric Mate radio article by uh, Jim Musgrove, K5BZH. And he was writing back in December 1991. Just let me, let me share this with, the, with our listeners. There's a different feeling about using a transmitter or receiver that is home constructed. Today's newcomers probably have no idea as to the amount of home brewing that took place in the 50s and 60s. It was a widespread practice even among the novices. The novice license was created in 1951 and the majority of novice transmitters in the early 50s were homemade. Home brewing was well established within the sideband group. Sometimes two or three friends would decide to build the same unit. Joe Galeski, W4IMP, told me that he had two friends in Johannesburg, ZS6ATA and ZS6ARQ, who built the sideband package simultaneously. They held weekly schedules on the air to discuss such things as parts placement and voltage measurements at particular nodes. Most of the old timers seem to feel a little sad that this practice has changed so dramatically. A few are even bitter about it. One fellow commented that today's hams are such damn wimps that they couldn't even begin to unscrew the self-tapping screws in their rice boxes. Oof, ouch. Uh, six, six Rexford, W2TBZ, said it best with, quote, early sidebanders were scroungers and dump pickers of the first water. No piece of surplus equipment or abandoned radio was safe. Every capacitor, choke, coil, tube, IF can, or crystal was pressed into service. It was a grand and glorious age, and I shed a bitter tear that it will never happen again. Well, it may be happening now. I don't know. I, I you know, what do you think? Yeah, but I, I wanted to comment on Galeski's rig. Three tubes. Yeah, I know, and two of them are six U eights. Yeah, and now there's a in the radio handbook, Bill Orr, mm -hmm. Bill Orr radio handbook. They yeah. got a, they got a two tube. Really? Two six U eights. Yeah. So I mean these guys built simple rigs with not when a lot I, when of, I not saw, parts when I, of tubes. When I see the imp, I I'm 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 sure like you, I see these things and I get the urge to build one. Yeah. And one of the reasons I want to do it is because it would complement so nicely the mate for the mighty midget receiver. Yes. From Lou McCoy, which uses three six U eights. Yeah. So you got, you'd have a, a three tube receiver and a three tube transmitter. It'd be pretty cool. I could build it on a, on a, a discarded chassis from a, from an old Benton Harbor lunchbox. <laughs> Ooh, you see, I see, see things are going here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, I uh, I wanted to mention that the two rigs that you mentioned, the W two E W L and and Galeski uh, IMP's yeah. rig. If you can get a copy of the earlier copy of the sideband handbook from the A W R L, yeah. both of those are in that. That edition. I, I, I don't have the first copy. I think I have the 1965 edition. You got with Rudolph Fisher's big ham HRO type receiver, the solid state oh, receiver. Yeah. That, that's the later edition. The one that preceded that has those two rigs in it. I, I, I've got them because I got online versions of the articles that people sent to me, and I put links up on the, uh, on the Solder Smoke blog. But it would be fun to look into those handbooks. Those handbooks, by the way, are excellent. The SSB, ARRL SSB books. Were, are really inspirational. A lot of good information in there. You know, we've been I've been bad mouthing the 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 ARRL lately because they got the sideband inversion and the myth wrong repeatedly. But everybody makes mistakes. Anyway, this all this work on the Moxon has been leading me to do other things. First, on the on the on the MythBuster has le led me to do other things. The MythBuster doesn't have an RF amplifier. It goes antenna. On the receive side, it goes antenna bandpass filters right into the uh, AB, ABE1 mixer and then into the into the TIAs and the crystals and the crystal filter. So it made me realize that, and this follows the guidance from a lot of the uh, the kind of the, the receiver gurus, that you shouldn't put a lot of gain ahead of the, the mixer, especially on bands below, say, 20 meters or so. And I, I found that I didn't need it. And not having the RF amplifier in there prevents a lot of unnecessarily unnecessary overloading and uh, and um, and distortion. So 
I went back and I looked at the Digitia, which I built pretty much based on BitX20, BitX40 architecture. And I had an RF amplifier in there. And I, and I had it set, because it's a TIA, I had it set at about 15 dB, which is too much. I mean, sometimes a lot of these designers will recommend maybe 5 dB of RF amplification ahead of the mixer. But because it was a TIA, I was able to look back at, at Wes and Bob Kopsky's um, article on the TIA amps and change just two resistors, change the feedback resistor and the uh, emitter degenerator resistor in the amplifier and take it from 15 dB down to about 7 dB, which is, is better. You know, I, I, I don't really notice a difference because the problem doesn't really arise until there's a lot of like really strong CW signals like they're in a CW contest but this might help. And it was kind of fun to go in there and work on the Digitia. And while I was doing that, Pete, I blew the dust off the, um, the BitX 17 and got back on 17 meters. 17 is still not in great shape, but it's open for a few hours in the morning and early afternoon. And I've been working all kinds of interesting guys. 17 meters has such a nice feel to it. It's kind of a friendly band. It's no contests, not a lot of competition there. And one of the first stations I met, I, I talked to was um, HP3SS down in Panama. And talked to him. We started talking about home brew. And he's an old-time home brewer. He hasn't, he hasn't, I don't think he's melted any solder recently. But way back, back in the day, he built a lot of things. He built the HBR receiver with 13 tubes in it. And he said it was identical to the, uh, to the article that appeared in QST. And then kind of the, the last bit of the story was, that I think when he was getting ready to move to Panama, or years later at any rate, he, he wanted to sell the thing, and he put an ad up, and he got a response from Joe Walsh of the Eagles. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe bought it from him. So <laughs> I guess if you got to get rid of your homebrew receiver, sending it off to Joe Walsh is a good way to yeah. go. Hey, hey I, so, wanted to, um, I wanted to comment on um, you're talking about no, no RF amplifiers on the front end. If you check out, W7ZOI's uh, seminal project, December 89, January 1990. Uh, QST had a two-part article on a 20-meter QRP single sideband transceiver. No RF yes. amplifier. No RF amplifier in there. I know. I, I think that's the way to go. And I, I also noticed, for example, that, that Farhan, in the design for the BitX20, had an RF amplifier in it. In the, in the uh, BitX40 module, there, there was an RF amplifier in it. But when he came out with the, the micro bit X that, that, were, that a lot of us have, there's no RF amplifier in the micro bit X. So I may, be, I may be wrong. I think that's the way he went. So I think he kind of moved in that direction, direction also. S same thing for the Atlas radios. Atlas yeah. radios didn't have any RF amplifiers. Well, you know, you really don't need it. I, I knew I didn't need it when I fired up the Mythbuster. And, you know, you could tell whether you need it or not. When you connect the antenna, if you hear the noise go up, you're, you're hearing down to the noise floor, the external noise floor, right? And, and, and you can't really, more sensitivity than that's not going to do you any good. Put it in the and audio my, amp stage. You, you know, you're right about the audio amplifier stage. One of the reasons I don't, you don't really have to worry so much about how much gain you have in the rest of the receiver is because with the LM386 or a similar kind of op amp and one stage of AF preamplification, You've got so much gain sitting there in the audio amp that it kind of makes up for whatever shortcomings you might have. I mean, you don't have to worry about whether you're losing 3 dB or 5 dB or 6 dB by not putting an RF amplifier in there. Heck, you've got, you know, 60 or 70 dBs of audio gain available to you there. And that's a lot. So, yeah. Um, good stuff. Hey, listen, but the band's coming back. It's got me thinking about a directional antenna. Gosh, I'm torn. I want to build another Moxon. They were so much fun to build. But I want to also have an antenna for both 20 and 17. And it's almost impossible to easily nest a Moxon for 17 and 20. You can do it with the hex beam. Can't do it with the Moxon. I, I, I was just looking this morning at an article by L.B. Sebik, w, I think the, the before RNL, who was the, who was the master in this. And he says it's hard. He says you sometimes can do it if you skip a band, like if you go, you know, 20 to 20 to 12 or something like that. But 20 and 17, kind of close, hard to do. FLB says it's hard. It's too hard for me. So uh, the thing I'm thinking about now is just going out and buying a, buying a Moxon, buying a Hexbeam. 
and putting the hex beam up there with the elements for 20 and 17. But Pete, it just seems wrong. It seems wrong. I mean, I've got, I'm surrounded by homebrew rigs, all this melted solder, wooden boxes, goofy looking cabinets, and I'm going to hook it up to a commercial antenna. I know. What, what do you think? I mean, am I, should I? Well, build two, two moxins. <laughs> I don't have enough room on the roof. <laughs> well, let's stack them. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's your option. There's your option. I seek guidance from the uh, from the brotherhood and sisterhood out there. Please let me know what to do. Um, anyway, shameless commerce division. Bong. Hey, listen. Um, send us the. Uh, continue to use the link to the to the Bezos thing in the upper right hand corner. It's not quite in the corner. It's on the upper right hand side of the uh, of the blog. I, I remodeled the blog a little bit and put a couple things. I got a new picture of Pete there. It's really good. I got the IBEW sticker. I got the CBLA um, uh, 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 logo for the Color Burst Liberation Army. All kinds of other good stuff there. Check it out. I think you guys like it. Oh, Dino, Dino sent me a nice gif with, with smoke rising from the soldering iron. That's on the left-hand side. But uh, go ahead and use the, uh, the, the link there. Whenever you're going to buy something from Amazon, start out on our page there. And cha-ching, old man Bezos will send us some money. So that's that's, that's kind of good to do that. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, I meant to mention earlier, as long as we're on this topic, it's kind of said, I'm not, uh, um, Google, the suits at Google and, uh, and FeedBurner have decided to discontinue the email service attached to the blog. So it used to be that whenever I put up a blog post, people who had signed up for the email service would receive an email saying, basically, there's a new solder smoke blog post posted. That's going to stop at the end of August. And, uh, it's kind of unfortunate. If this is going to cause problems for any of you guys, please let me know. You can still subscribe to the blog and you can still subscribe to the podcast and get notifications through your RSS and things like that. But you're not going to get an email anymore. If, if some of you have become, if, if the email is very, very important to you, please send me an email. Let me know. But um, it, it's unfortunate. It was so easy to do. You People would just sign up. They'd be signed up. I would post something on the on the blog and then boom an email would go out notifying them that that you know bill had posted another another blog post but they're going to stop that on august 31st so uh, let me know if that's going to if that is going to cause you trouble and I'll, I'll try to explore alternative ways of doing it but it it might be difficult we'll, we'll see let, let me know well what would prompt them to stop that i mean I don't it's, know. it's it's no one maintains it it's just you know, automatic. It's all automatic. It's all I don't automatic, know. You know. I don't know. I don't understand. Hey, Pete, I just wanted to talk a little bit about test gear before we get to the uh, to the mailbag. You know, we've been talking about two pieces of uh, of test gear that have come available. One is the Nano VNA, and the other is the Tiny SA. Both of them available. I don't know for about a hundred bucks, and you could do interesting things with both of them. Uh, I, I got the Nano VNA a while back, and one of the things I was hoping to do with the Nano VNA was to have a kind of a, an easy way just to look into a, 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 a solid state amplifier and measure the input impedance or the output impedance of that amplifier. And the Nano VNA promised to do that. But when I tried to do it, I kept getting all kinds of crazy readings. It was obviously not right. And for example, one of the ways I knew that it was not right was that I was looking into uh, Wes Hayward's TIA amps. And Wes Hayward in the article, Wes and Bob wrote that these TIA amps should be basically 50 ohms no matter what you hang at the other end. That's the whole idea. But I was not getting 50 ohms. And no, it didn't matter what I hung at the other end. It was never 50 ohms. So that made me suspect that the problem is not the amplifier. The problem was the nano VNA. And I started looking around for it. And we, with the help of Alan W2AEW, found the problem. And it was that the, the nano VNA was putting out too much power when it was doing this measurement. And it was causing, it was driving the amplifiers that I was testing into saturation. And it was resulting in an inaccurate reading of input or output impedance. So the, the solution was to put a little screw-on attenuator, a 30, I, had, I happened to have a 30 dB attenuator in the box that came with the tiny SA. Alan, I think, was using a 13 dB attenuator. And once we put those in there, 
it gave a, an accurate 50 ohm ohm reading. So I, I know you got, you got some concerns about the nano VNA. What 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 do you think? Uh, I I saw the same thing. Did you get? I've got two of them. Yeah. And they don't match. Yeah. I mean, you put one on one, put one on the other, and I, you don't get the same answer. I mean, you, you, the only thing you're changing is the nano VNA. Hmm. And, the, and the other thing is, I, I don't see it working beyond six meters. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it definitely bear, bear, warrants some, some further investigation. But, but Alan was really cool. He went ahead. I said, Alan, could you please do a, do, do a video on this? And he, he's, he's got this great style with videos. And so he did a good, good video. Guys, guys, check it out. And uh, there, he also said that there's a way you could get around. You could set the output power from the Nano VNA, but it requires you to put in new new firmware into the Nano VNA. Oh, that'll work. <laughs> oh my god yeah. but, but I, I see so this is update your computer good. Yeah, update I, your computer right oh, oh my god I, I just I just said you know what I, I think I'll just stick with the attenuator yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the old clunky firmware yeah. even the thought occurred to me maybe I could buy a new one that already has the firmware in it then I won't have to go through the update because guys who are real technical wizards like Alan He'll describe how to do the update. He'll say, oh, this is very easy. You just do this, 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 and that. And I'm thinking, man, I lost him about the third step. And so uh, I don't know about that. So anyway, the other the other piece of test gear is the Tiny SA. It's a spectrum analyzer. And it comes in the same package. I think it's comes from the same company. It's it's interesting. I mean, for a long time, we were, we were told by a lot of people that you couldn't really homebrew for it's with solid state unless you had a spectrum analyzer and the spectrum analyzers all cost at least thirty thousand dollars or something like that here's a spectrum analyzer it's basically got an sdr uh circuitry in it like the like the nano vna and um it it works it works pretty well i mean it, one of the things i do with it is i i set it up on the on the table here with a little kind of eight inch telescoping antenna that comes with it and i just then i'll go ahead and just transmit and see what you know what it's picking up from my transmitters what does the third harmonic look like what does the second harmonic look like how far down is it i'm sure i could do much more kind of uh, exacting and much more precise measurements if i actually hooked it to the output of the transmitter but i'm afraid i'm going to blow the thing up so i haven't done that yet um, it's it's fun to play around with just a telescoping antenna one thing it won't do is i was hoping that i would be able to see kind of opposite sideband rejection you know, take a look at the output at different points in the transmitter and see how much the crystal filter, for example, was knocking down the, the other sideband, how much the crystal filter and the balance modulator were knocking down the carrier. But I discovered that the um, resolution bandwidth of the Tiny SA, the best you can get is 3 kilohertz, which is not enough. So yeah. you, just, you, you can't see <laughs> yeah. down that accurately. Yeah. It's not really made to see down at that level of accuracy but what the other thing i discovered and this is what you can discover from uh, uh looking at youtubes is that um you know you can you, if you set the nano you set the tiny sa to like from 87 to 108 megahertz you can see the broadcast band so i know what the what the strong FM broadcast stations are. We have a station that's within sight of my QTH. It's at 100.3. It's a classic rock FM station. And I can, when I turn on the nano, I said, nano, the tiny SA, even with the telescoping antenna, boom, clear as a bell. There's the signal from this thing. It's 50,000 watts. It's a big, it's a big power station on FM. Um, but the thing I didn't realize is that you can also listen to it with the tiny SA. You have to open the thing up and you have to solder in an earphone or an AF amplifier or a computer speaker or something. But if you do that, you can listen with the tiny SA and use it as a, as a, as a kind of as a receiver. Now, I haven't done it yet because I didn't feel like cracking the thing open and start soldering in there. But I wonder if any of the solder smoke listeners have been listening around with their uh, with their tiny SAs. Hey, hey, go back to your problem of mentioning the opposite sideband. Yeah. You know, there's a way to do that old school. And one way that what you do that is you set up a signal generator and you tune one sideband and yeah. the other sideband and you use an audio voltmeter. Yeah. And what you can do is 
it's the ratio you're interested in. It doesn't matter about the act, actual reading. You can yeah. take the ratio of those two and you'll come up with the side the difference in the sidebands. I school. did a very I did a very rough rough way of doing that. Even even more kind of old school rougher was and I described this on one of the Mythbuster videos. You know, I can hear on 75 meters I can hear the AM guys, especially the the uh, old military radio net on Saturday morning. And so I I was yes. listening and I could what I would do with the Mythbuster is I would zero beat it and okay fine I'm hearing the carriers now zero beat it out and I'm listening to the to one sideband I tune one way and I'm moving the carrier into the pass band of the crystal filter and I woo, you can hear it in there now I tune the other way and I'm tuning away from the carrier how much of the carrier do I hear nothing it goes drops and, it, and it's the result of the steep skirts on the 10 kilohertz filter with a four with a four pole crystal You'll filter, hear the skirts would have been wide and I would have heard a little bit of it on the other side. Yeah. But with the 10 pole filter, no. I noticed that on the on the micro bit X, for example, I was looking at the micro bit X because Roger, Papa Alpha One Zulu Zulu, uh, he, he just recently moved and he sent me his micro bit X. And I just was looking at the board. If Farhan has eight poles, he has eight crystals in that 12 megahertz filter on the micro bit X, which has got to have very, very steep skirts also. So yeah good stuff but i like the old school technique too but I, I was hoping to be able to see it i couldn't see it you know three kilohertz uh receive bandwidth uh, um, uh, 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 uh resolution <laughs> bandwidth was just quite not enough hey pete time is getting tight here we got to go to the mailbag all right real quick um i mentioned the feed bear feed and the feed burner on the emails hey listen paul vk3hn sent a really nice email and made a good post about possibly adding automatic gain control to the TIA amps. Uh, this was a really interesting question. We went back and forth on it. Farhan and Farhan is looking at this issue and Paul is also looking at it and they're looking at options on how to properly do this with advice from a leading wizard who will remain unidentified. He's helping them. So I, I think these guys are on the right path. They've already got some good insights. It's an interesting question for those who feel that they need automatic gain control. I've been with Farhan with this for many years. I'm a believer in manual gain control, which means I reach up and I turn down the audio or the RF gain control a lot simpler. But anyway, uh, they're, they're looking at that. We, I have a blog post about Cyprian from Romania who built a, a Michigan Mighty Might a way back. And it's a really beautiful piece of work. Check out Cyprian's Romanian Mighty Might. I mentioned Dino, KL0S. He sent us a, new, a nice graphical representation of the solder smoke iron. He also sent me a nice graphic where he was thinking about sideband inversion and going beyond the simple kind of formula that, um, uh, that, that we have where it, you, you get inversion if you're subtracting the signal with modulation from the signal without modulation. He actually took the time to, to sort of draw out different scenarios of mixing and, and, and trying to discover by looking at where the audio would be and where the carrier would be to see which would result in inversion. Of course, he, he confirmed what I refer to as the Hallis rule from Joel Hallis of, of AWRL. He's the one who formulated this uh, subtract the modulated signal from the unmodulated signal to get inversion. All other cases, not. Um, so thanks for that, Dino, and the graphic looks really good. Hey, Pete, I heard from Allison, KB1GMX. Haven't heard from her in a while. Oh, yeah. But but she's doing very well. I'm happy to report. And I was asking her about the uh, the possibility of putting 24 volts on the drain of an IRF 510 in the Mythbuster. And I'm, I'm, she's giving me good advice on that. I haven't, I, I kind of did a kind of halfway quick, but it, quick implementation of it, but it resulted in a lot of feedback, so I backed off. But I'm going to try again and see if I can get 24 volts on the IRF 510 drain. Um, Dave, K8 Whiskey Papa Echo, wrote to me about the origins of the idea of Wabi Sabi. This is something from George Dobbs. George Dobbs talked about this. It's a kind of a design thing from Asia. Um, and uh, Dave has been going back listening to some of the old podcasts. Um, uh, he also sent me a whole pile of parts. He had a whole bunch of old parts, a whole bunch of Motorola transistors that I got him. And Pete, included in the batch, was a bag of 40673s, dual gate MOSFETs. Doug DeMaul would be so pleased. Steve, N8NM, is building a 17-meter rig using 
22, uh, 22.1184 crystals in a Super VXO. My 17 meter rig also uses an, a VXO up at around 23 megahertz. Um, again, Doug DeMall would be very pleased with the use of VXOs. He's using, a, and Steve is using a 4 megahertz filter. Mine was using a 5 megahertz filter. A fine business, and he's getting, he's experiencing some alfresco thrills with this rig. Good, good work, Steve. Um, Dean, KK4DIS, has, in addition to his work on the, the simple SSB rig and with the Vienna Wireless Society, has been restoring an old Zenith broadcast radio, working with tubes and high voltage. You and I told him both the same thing. One hand behind your, your back there, Dean. Yeah. You know, go ahead. I, I was just going to give a plug to Just Radios. That's where yeah. Dean found all the parts. So if you're doing any tube restoration and you need the, all those high voltage capacitors and you know the 0.01s at 1600 volts, uh, just radios. They're they're in Canada, but he ships from the United States. He walks across the border with the box and puts it in the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he doesn't get arrested. <laughs> just just radios. All right. Just radios. Good yeah, but, source. Good good source. But again, Dean, one hand behind your back, old man. Yeah. Remember. Volts jolt, but mills kill. Right, yeah. the old, the yeah. old, the old saying. Also, I hope I don't know if uh, if Dean saw this, but I came across a, an old video on E. Howard Armstrong, and they talked about how Zenith Company got its name from the original call sign of one of the founders. His old ham radio call sign was Nine Zulu November, Nine Zulu November, and from that came Zenith. Didn't know, didn't know. Very good. Pete Eaton, we, we hear from Pete a lot. He's been, he was debating whether to build an SSB rig or a DSB rig for 17. And I said, I think you said too, start with DSB, Pete. SSB is a lot harder. I often get guys say, oh, well, you just, just put in a, you know, a filter and a mixer and you, you're good. And I said, man, I've been there, done that. Believe me, SSB is harder. DSB is easy. CW, CW is harder. Huh? <laughs> CW is harder. CW is hard too. I know it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Richard, uh, we, we got. I, I came across a, a question from Richard. KN7FSZ is a fine uh, Kilo November 7 Foxtrot Sierra Zulu, a very fine business HBU. And he asked about uh, the Galaxy 5 VFO. And he, he wanted the circuit that I used to, to solid state it. So I sent it to him, but I, I did so with trepidation because he said he had four Galaxy 5s that he was thinking about working on. Can you imagine the boat anchor carnage? If, if the circuit that I developed leads to the destruction of four perfectly good Galaxy 5s, Sounds like I the feel Q, responsible. QF1 Q multiplier, Bill. <laughs> well, I, I know. I feel bad enough about that. I've got, I've got dead QF1 multipliers all around here. I'm respar responsible for a worldwide shortage. Um, I think, Pete, you're, you're responsible for this too. So, I, Walter, uh, KA4 KXX wrote to me about the benefits of no-tune bandpass filters like the ones used by Farhan. Agreed, Walter. I agree. Uh, Jack, uh, 5B4 APL, wrote to me about oh, oh, time hold crystals. A, hold a second. Your Mythbuster 17 video, you got to see that because you take that fixed tuned bandpass filter and you show how to scrunch or widen ah, yeah. the coils to tune it. That is really worth seeing, the Mythbuster 17. It's it's something that we all learn very often on the bench when you wind a coil and you give it exactly 16 turns as defined by the calculator, you get the precise value of the capacitors in there, and then you find out that it's about 2 megahertz off. Yes. And so one of the things you could do is you could pull the, thing, pull, pull the coils out and rewind them, which is a pain, but if you scrunch them together a little bit, you can get additional inductance and it in effect becomes kind of like a variable inductor cheap and easy i'm glad myth, you spotted myth, that, Pete. that was myth fun. buster 17 yes good watch that one hey um jack is our, our old friend a member of the vienna wireless society jack welch he's now operating his five bravo four alpha papa lima under the hot cypriot sun and he wrote uh, an article to me about time crystals you know google has discovered these time crystals and how to homebrew in the fourth dimension. I said, fine business, old man. Um, I have his message on the blog. Um, 
I put to put it diplomatically, I think Jack may have been spending a little bit too much time under the hot Cypriot sun, moving into the fourth dimension. Um, good to hear from you, Jack. Keep up the good work. Stay in the shade, old man. Uh, Moses, K8. T-I-Y, listens to the podcast with his young son, Robert. Yeah, crank it in, Robert. Um, Farhan had, uh, has a new rig. It was up on Hackaday called the s Bidex. It's a combination of hardware-defined radio and software-defined radio. A really excellent video. I have that up on the blog, too. Check it out. Glad. Also, we, got, we had up on, uh, on the blog that moved over to, to Hackaday, uh, Tom. He has no call sign, but he built the receiver from Junkbox Satellite Parts. He built a pretty sophisticated receiver yeah. there using field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs. And I think that's why Hackaday got interested in it. Jenny List loves this stuff. She's over at Hackaday. She does a great job. Ryan Flowers, our friend now, is writing for Hackaday, too. Oh, so I didn't know that. Watch, watch, out, watch out for Ryan's yeah. column, too. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, Todd, K7TFC, he sent me a really beautiful message about the spirit of home brewing in the modern age. It was in a comment on one of my, um, I think I wrote, a, I wrote a, an article about Rob Sherwood. Rob Sherwood, was, who's a, one of the receiver gurus, a really great receiver guru, had um, been interviewed. And, and he made some comments about how little home brewing is being done today. And he just sort of kind of matter-of-factly accepted that, well, you know, we're, we're all using commercial receivers because they're better and we got to just stick with that. And then I said, I didn't like that part too much. And then Todd agreed with me. And he sent in, I think, a really, really beautiful message, a comment about the spirit of home brewing. It was so good that I pulled it out of the comment and made it a standalone a blog post so that more people could see it. Check it out. Um, Grayson, KJ7UM, was interviewed at our suggestion, by the way, by uh, the, the Ham Radio Workbench uh, podcast of George Zaff. A really great interview. Jason, Jason says some really, I, and Grayson says some really nice things. And he has some real tongue-in-cheek advice about how to avoid injury when working with tubes. I don't know if you saw that. He said, don't swallow anything. Yeah, right. Try not to sit on the tubes. <laughs> Be careful, OA tubes. OA tubes, yeah, they're, they're radioactive. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was a great interview. Um, Aaron, K5ATG, is running a micro bit X with a homebrew tuner and, uh, and a homebrew antenna. I hope I can work him soon. And listen, one other thing I wanted to mention. I was listening the other night on 40 with the 40 Digit T, and I heard uh, an old friend of the podcast, Mike, Whiskey Alpha 3 Oscar up in up in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Your old, your old stomping grass. Yeah, Mike. And he was talking uh, on, the, on the air about his new high-powered linear amplifier. Yes. Water-cooled. Yes. Yes. Water-cooled. Yes. This is just so cool. He started talking to the other guy, and they were debating whether they should put water in the water-cooled amplifier or, or antifreeze. Anti yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, that, that got me right there. Anyway, fine business. He has he has pictures up on his QRZ.com page. Check it out. Hey, hey, Pete, I just got to close with this one quote. I have here a whole collection of zingers from Frank Jones in the FMLA articles by Michael Hopkins. And I, we don't have time to go into all of them. You got to run. I got to run. I'm going to put them all up on the blog here so people can look at them. But there's one I got to read. Okay, so Michael Hopkins is describing his first encounter with Frank Jones. The author is, was, in, it was in CW Contact on 6 Meter with a guy who turns out to be Frank Jones. And this is what Michael writes. I threw the switch on my AEA keyer and sent the station description while I deciphered my notes. When the keyer signed, Frank said, QSL the commercial gear, ever think about taking up amateur radio? <laughs> A lot of that kind of stuff by Frank Jones. So, you guys sounds gotta like, read the FMLA article. Sounds like, I put the whole collection up there. Sounds like Tesla about Edison, you know, about the 90, 99% perspiration one percent inspiration <laughs> he said if he, if, if, if he noodled a little bit more he wouldn't have to perspire so much <laughs> man there's a lot of this kind of stuff it'll yeah. warm the hearts of home brewers yeah and i'll put it up on the blog hey pete we've been rambling on here for more than an hour my friend it's time to go you bet seven thanks very much thanks for getting up so early in the morning yeah seven threes from the left coast Seven threes from Northern Virginia, guys. See you next time. You bet. Bye bye. Ciao. Ciao. The Solder Smoke Podcast is produced once or twice a month using roadkill computers in an electronics workshop 
somewhere in the wilds of Northern Virginia. The podcast is available via iTunes and directly from our website, soldersmoke.com. Our blog, the Solder Smoke Daily News, is at soldersmoke.blogspot.com. Send email to soldersmoke, that's one word, at yahoo.com. Solder Smoke is listener-supported, and there are many ways you can help keep the podcast going. Please spread the word.